In this video, I'm gonna be discussing a sensitive topic. I'm gonna to be discussing my experience with sleep paralysis, as well as the realities of the demonic realm, sexual sin and how it opens doors, as well as how I got free from that experience. So this video is gonna go into topics that deal with the supernatural. And to be quite honest, a lot of the body of Christ is not nearly as equipped enough in that area as we should be. 2 Corinthians 2.11 talks about Satan not outwitting us by us not being unaware of his schemes. But unfortunately for many people in the church world, we are unaware of the enemy schemes. And so Satan is outwitting us in various ways and we're experiencing more levels of bondage than a blood-bought child of God is supposed to experience. And in addition to that, a lot of us are also not walking nearly in the level of power of the spirit that God intended us to when he said that I am leaving you a comforter, I'm equipping you with power from on high. A lot of us are not well versed enough and educated enough in those things in order to be walking in the fullness of the power that Jesus Christ made available to us. So to that end, not only did the Lord instruct me to make this video, which I wasn't planning on making, um, but I will do it, but he also instructed me to put together a training on the spiritual gifts to help the church rise in the knowledge of the gifts of the spirit so that we can walk in the power of the promise that Jesus Christ gave us. So I believe for many people after watching this video, that would be a great next step. Um, I invite you to click the link in the description box to learn more. I'll remind you about it again at the end of the video. And for now, let's get into the topic at hand. So what was my experience with sleep paralysis like? So from the time I was a teenager through to my adult years, I mean, even bleeding into some of my married adult years, okay? I off and on would experience sleep paralysis episodes. And so what it would feel like, I mean, there I know nowadays there's a lot of people on YouTube who kind of talk about it. So I think it's becoming more, I don't know, more discussed. But the way it would feel like for me is when I'm trying to wake up, my mind wakes up. I'm aware, I'm aware of the room, where I am, all of that. It's like I'm conscious, but I cannot move and I cannot speak. I feel trapped in my body and it's a very jarring experience, okay? So even when I'm trying to like speak or call out, it's like I, it's like I can't even use my vocal cords because sometimes when you're like trying to break out of it, you wanna be like, mm, mm, like even if you can't open your mouth, but it's like, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't use my vocal cords. I couldn't open my mouth. I couldn't move. It's just like feeling locked and you're aware and locked until you're able to break out of it. For a lot of people that breaking out of it involves praying, even if you like, whether you can get it out your mouth or whether you can just like pray from your spirit, but that's how it would be for me. Um, in my married years, when I would experience it, you know, Jarrell would be laying next to me. And I would just remember often feeling like, oh, if I could only like get my elbow to like nudge him, but it's like, you can't, you, it's like, you can't, like even your elbow and it's like, I'm aware it's like, he's right there and I can't get to him. And that would feel so frustrating. And I would just be hoping inside, like, oh, I just hope he could like see that I'm going through something, like see that, like, can you tell that it's happening? And I would just like be so desperate for him to like shake me or like bring me out of it. Um, or I'd be trying to use my voice to like tell him to like help, but I couldn't, I couldn't use my voice. I couldn't nudge him, nothing. It's like your only recourse is like prayer, <laughs> waiting it out in prayer. And that, that's been my experience and my pattern. That wouldn't happen to me every night or even like every week, but it would happen frequently enough where it's like a recurring pattern where it happens every so often, right? Now I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna talk about how the medical community talks about this. Because of course, if you're experiencing something from the time you're a teenager like me, you're gonna look it up and you're gonna Google it. So over the years, I did a lot of Googling on this, okay? And I know that some people may be tempted to see this as simply a medical condition, but I am firmly of the mind that while this can be medically observed, that it is spiritually caused. Okay, I'm just gonna read to you some of the things you'll find when you Google sleep paralysis, like from a medical standpoint, okay? So sleepfoundation.org describes sleep paralysis as a temporary loss of muscle control just after falling asleep or before waking up. Okay, sounds kind of normal so far. Far weird, but okay, kind of normal. 
But then listen to this. Sleep paralysis frequently involves hallucinations or a feeling of suffocation. Hmm. No one knows exactly what causes sleep paralysis, but it is linked to sleep disorders and certain mental health conditions. That sounds suspicious to me. Continuing on, when they're talking about this uh, hallucination piece that a lot of people experience, they describe that they are often intruder hallucinations that involve the perception of a dangerous person or presence in the room. And they say that about 75% of sleep paralysis episodes involve hallucinations. Another website, uh, Very Well Health, talks about the symptoms of sleep paralysis, this thing that's, um, oh, a temporary loss of muscle control. These are the symptoms of that. Hmm. Sense of suffocating or breathlessness, chest pressure, or feeling as if someone is standing or sitting on chest, transient inability to move or speak during sleep transitions. I don't know about you, but that don't all sound right, okay? Now, you'll find that they say things like, oh, you know, your brain releases chemicals while you're sleeping that keep you from moving, so you're kind of like temporary paralyzed, except you can still breathe, um, and then those chemicals just don't wear off fast enough. Okay, they'll you'll find things like that. But there is absolutely no explanation for why is that accompanied by hallucinations, and not only that, a very specific hallucination of a dangerous presence, uh, of being suffocated, of being sat on. Like, it's not explaining any of that. And also, why? Why is that happening? Why are these very specific symptoms accompanying this? And why? Why is this even happening in the first place? And so this is where I believe the medical community, while it's important and I respect it, I believe that it has limits because science is observing the physical world, which we know is a real world, but the physical world is not the only world that exists. There is also a spiritual world that is permeating and extending beyond everything. And so science is simply measuring the part of reality that is the physical world, but it is not able to observe and measure and explain the parts that go beyond the physical world. I'm going to give you an example of this in scripture. So in Luke chapter 13, we see a woman who is bent over, like her back cannot straighten up, right? So she's been bent, walking like bent over for years. So if a doctor were to like x-ray her back or examine her back, I'm sure we would be able to see like which discs are off or like why is the spine um, not aligned? You know, we would probably be able to physically see or measure some kind of maybe a spinal injury, or maybe we would call that scoliosis or kyphosis, or we might have a term for it, but that doesn't necessarily tell us the cause of it. And so this woman had a, um, a physical symptom, a physical disorder where her back was bent over, and the Bible says that Jesus cast a demon out of her and her spine straightened. So that is very interesting because even though I'm sure a hunched spine is something that we could have medically observed, it wasn't medically caused. The Bible clearly shows us that a demon had caused this deformity of her spine. And as soon as the demon was cast out, the spine was restored to the way it was supposed to be. And I believe that story is so important because I think it illustrates the fact that it is possible to medically observe something, but it still have a spiritual cause. And then whatever's happening physically, it's responding to a spiritual solution, not merely a medical solution. And I believe that in at least many, if not most, if not all cases of sleep paralysis, that that is the case. Now let's talk about times when I experienced the paranormal side of sleep paralysis, okay? So I'll tell you three examples. So the first time I remember something paranormally accompanying this sleep paralysis experience was when I was a teenager. And I thought I had woken up because I was seeing my room, my bed, everything. And I looked in the doorway and I saw like a figure, like it looked shadowy. So in my mind, I thought that's weird. Like why is someone standing there? Like I couldn't quite tell, you know, it was still kind of dark. 
but I saw like the figure from the hall, you know, standing in the doorway. And so I just remember thinking like, that's weird. But then I go to like say something or move and I realize I'm in that sleep paralysis thing. And now I feel like super uncomfortable because it's like, oh my gosh, like someone's standing there. I can't move or see who it is. And after it ends, I realized like, oh, no one's standing there. So at the time I thought, wow, that was like kind of creepy, but I just chalked it up to, okay, like I guess I was tripping or maybe I was still asleep or, you know, I just chalked it up to all that. Although the only thing that made me side eye that is that later on, I found out that someone else in my house had a really creepy dream that same night that I thought I saw someone standing there and I thought, okay. That's really, really weird. But I still was just like, okay, I'm gonna let that go. I don't know what happened, that was weird. Now there was another time the sleep paralysis thing was happening to me and I promise you, I felt the bed go down. Again, I thought someone came in my room in the night, which you know I don't like, <laughs> that, that would be weird, but I was like, okay, maybe like one of my parents came in here, maybe they're about to talk to me or something. Cause it's like, you know, the feeling of like, the mattress, it's like a very specific feeling of like the springs going down. So it's like, I felt this, like the pressure of like the mattress going down and I'm trying to like wake up so I can like see who's there and talk to them and see what's going on. And I'm locked and I'm like, what in the world? So again, then I have this like feeling of fear and panic, like what is happening? Who is right here? And I'm trying to do the breaking out thing. And again, you can't move or speak. You just have to, if anything, like try to pray, like Lord Jesus, help me. Again, once it's over, I see no one there. No one's in my room. No one's sitting down. And I'm like, that's crazy because I like felt the bed going down. So then an experience later in life as an adult. What really made me so upset about this experience is I literally had been praying in the middle of the night. Like I had been up, ended up falling asleep on the couch. And then when I'm waking up from that like nap on the couch, the sleep paralysis thing happens to me. And I'm thinking really like not right after I prayed, but here's the creepy part. I know how this sounds, but right before I came out of like the sleep paralysis feeling, I heard a door creak or so I thought. It was that sound of like, like a creaky door opening. And after I heard that creaky door opening sound, I also thought I heard someone say hello. It's actually kind of giving me chills right now, <laughs> um, but we had the victory in Jesus name, so don't be scared. But it was like a very creepy melodic hello, almost like kind of mocking you with the fake pleasant sound kind of creepy hello. So. Then I'm like trying to break out of it. Of course I can't, so I just have to pray in the name of Jesus. You know, I can't say that out loud, but it's like you have to kind of pray it in your spirit, at least for me, and then it's over. After that one, I got up and I'm like opening the door. It's like, what door in here sounds like that? Like, did someone, did I mistake it? Did my husband open the door? Like, did he, you know what I mean? So I'm like walking around in the house, like testing the doors. I'm like, none of these doors sound like that. So that was that one. Now, I had those experiences sometimes, but I wouldn't even say that happened most of the time. Like that was a small percentage of the time where I would say that I would experience something like that along with the, the sleep paralysis feeling. But this is what I will say. For me personally, the absolute worst part of the experience were the dreams that I would have when this sleep paralysis stuff would be happening. So for context, I am a dreamer. The Lord speaks to me very powerfully in my dreams. That has been the case since before even the sleep paralysis stuff was happening. The Lord has revealed real life situations to me in my dreams that I had no prior knowledge of and couldn't have known any other way, but he showed me the situation in a dream. He's warned me of like uh, people I know, like someone that's about to get into legal trouble. That's a very specific one that's happened like multiple times. Like this person's about to get in trouble, you need to wake up and pray for them. I remember that happened once. Randomly had a dream of a friend doing something illegal and I was like, what in the world? It's not their character, that's not how I know them. But I woke up, I had such an urgency, I was like, praying. Come to find out the next day I get a call, one of our mutual friends, and they're like, you gotta help so-and-so is appearing at court because they got caught up in something last night. Like crazy, like stuff like that has happened many, many times. Warnings, medical conditions, things to pray about for people. And a lot of it is actually just instructions and insight for my own life. But I say that to say, it's a powerful way that the Lord speaks to me. He's even shown me spiritual warfare. Like 
a big snake crawling through a house and I know uh, enemies trying to do something. I'm not a prophet, but I have prophetic dreams. So anyway, that's been a thing. But when the sleep paralysis um, episodes would happen, I would have a very, very specific and disturbing type of dream. And the dream that I would be having when that would happen often was of someone trying to molest me. And that for me by far was the worst part. Now for me personally, the person was not able to like successfully molest me, thank God, but it was like the imminent threat of it. And it was extremely creepy and extremely disturbing. And the worst part of it, it would be the face of someone I knew. And when I say the face of someone I knew, not only would it be, you know, very disturbing to think that like someone is trying to molest you, like someone that you know is trying to molest you, but it would be like someone where it would be extra, extra, extra disturbing and gross if it were that person. Okay, so like to give you an example, like it would be like if you have a dream that your great aunt, like your sweet great aunt is trying to molest you. You know what I'm saying? Like something creepy and disturbing. Like that's just sick and twisted. It would always be something like that. It just gave me the ickiest, like, ugh, like disgusting feeling. That for me was the part that I was like, what in the world? Like I couldn't understand like why, was, why that was happening. It really grossed me out. It really disturbed me worse than even the feeling of the sleep paralysis. And seeing that and experiencing that, I hated. Hated, hated, hated to the point like that's the part that at a certain point in my life, it made me like apprehensive going to sleep because I'm like, I hope this is not a sleep paralysis night because I do not want to have that creepy dream again. Now, the way that affected me in my waking life though, is that I would just kind of be like uneasy when I would have to see a person whose face was used in the dream, right? So like using the great aunt example, it would be like, let's say you go to her house and she's usually like really sweet, nice and making you cookies. It's like, she gives you a cookie and you're like, you know, you're just like a little, you're like, hey, you know, and you're trying to tell yourself like, this is my great aunt. Like that dream was not real. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's not plausible. Like what, what in the world? But it just made me like a little bit jumpy around the real, the people in real life. And that became something that was really, really hard to turn off. And so I was like, what in the world? But I didn't want to talk about that because who wants to say that? Like if you're having that dream, again, I'm gonna stick with this hypothetical example. Like if you're having a dream, like my great aunt, like my sweet elderly great aunt is like trying to molest. Like that sounds like what in the world? Like it sounds crazy, it sounds sick. Like you don't want to even say that, <laughs> right? So. I would tell, sometimes say that I'm experiencing the sleep paralysis thing, but I didn't feel comfortable fully explaining like the creepy dreams that I would have when that was happening. But thankfully in the era of YouTube, people tell their stories more, their experiences, their testimonies. And one day I found a woman talking about it. Now I wish I could remember who, this was years ago now, but I found someone on YouTube who was talking about this and I don't, know that everybody who experiences sleep paralysis has these kinds of dreams accompanying it, but this woman did. And it was the same thing. It was someone trying to molest her. And not only that, but she said, and it was like, she was talking about like the faces and the people that would be used to represent like who is trying to do this molestation. And it was like the exact, I knew it was like, she's experiencing the exact same thing I am. And that was the first time that I was like, okay. Because I was over there wondering like, do I have like a repressed memory or something? But like, it was the strangest thing because it didn't seem like it had ties to like actual events. And again, it wouldn't always be the same person. Now there were recurring characters and the recurring characters I would be the most creeped out around them because it's like, why is it often you? But it wouldn't be only them. It would be other people sometimes. So I was like, this is so weird. Like, what is this dream that happens when I'm having this experience? But she had the exact same experience. And then for her, she was talking about how she dealt with it spiritually from a standpoint of spiritual warfare and it ended. And I thought, okay, all right, I'm not gonna do any more Googling medically. What is this? Is this biological? Is this psychological? I now believe like this is spiritual. These sleep paralysis episodes, these are demonic in nature 
and the dreams only seem to be highlighting like that this is something perverted. This is something demonic that is happening. Now, another clue to this whole thing being demonic is how it impacted me in singleness versus how it impacted me in marriage. Now, I have to back up real quick and just give a little bit of context about my testimony. If you're watching this, you may know that my husband and I were both virgins when we got married. We have a video testimony about that, and we share that to encourage people in their journeys. There are many people who make the decision to practice sexual abstinence until they are married, and they get pressured by their friends or their family or their person that they're dating, and they get made to feel like, oh, you're gonna be weird if you, you know, remain a virgin till marriage. You're going to have to do something to keep them to stick around. You're like, you're never going to get married if you do that. People are going to think you're a weirdo, blah, blah, blah. You know, we've heard stories like that where people were encouraged by the testimony, you know, and the culture is just so inundated with sexual imagery to make sexual sin the norm that it's important. And we felt led by God to counter that messaging, to let people know, no, you can do things another way and it doesn't have to mean like that you're weird or you're going to end up single. You're going to end up alone your whole life if you make this decision. And so that's there for that. It's not there to make people feel bad who didn't have that specific testimony, but it's there to encourage people whether they've been abstinent their whole life or they're making a new decision to become abstinent after having not been. It's there to encourage people in that journey and to let people know it is possible to ask God to give you the grace to walk out that lifestyle. So my husband and I were both virgins when we got married. But for me, I still stumbled a lot with sexual sin, even in my singleness and in my virginity. More than my husband did. He had a more <laughs> pristine <laughs> testimony than I did. But for me, I still stumble. Just because you're a virgin doesn't mean that you're not committing any sort of sexual sin, whether physically or in your mind or anything. And so for me personally, I did stumble quite a bit, particularly when I was dating, because you know I was dating different people, getting to know people, and it would be so hard during that process to not stumble. So my husband and I, um, our first kiss was on our wedding date. But for me, when I was dating, that was not always the case. There were some people where we tried to have that rule, but not most of the time. And so it was very easy to get kind of caught in the pattern of, you know, okay, going from kissing into now this is feeling like a foreplay situation and doing things that are now feel like they're crossing a line. Now, not everybody feels convicted by that, but for me, when it would feel like, okay, we're going from kissing to this is too heated, it's crossing my line of conviction. And that is something that I would stumble with. And I felt always, you know, very convicted by that. And I never felt good about it. It was never something that I thought was okay. And like, let's just do this. No, it would definitely be something I tried to avoid and, you know, would sometimes go stretches and I, you know, try to have, you know, my standards like, no, you know, I can't really do this. I don't really, you know, I want to say that even all of that for marriage. Um, but it would still be difficult to not stumble. And I would find myself stumbling here and there. And then you'd be like, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't want to do this, you know, but it was hard. And I really credit my husband when we were dating. I feel like I was pulling on his grace, <laughs> his, his grace and integrity where it was guilt-free in that area. And not only that, but I kind of stumble with people I was dating. But then if I wasn't dating, you know, I went through a stretch of time where I struggled with self-pleasure. Not my entire singleness, but there was a patch of time where that was really a struggle too. Now I say that to say all those years when I was single and dating and even times where I would be stumbling into sexual sin, I never felt triggered by that molestation dream feeling that would happen when I would have sleep paralysis episodes. The discomfort that those experiences would create never trickled into my dating life. So if there was a boyfriend who was like getting too close to me, I would never feel like, oh no, someone's trying to molest me. I feel weird about it. Like never, 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 ever. It didn't cross my mind. They seemed like two completely unrelated things. It didn't bother me at all. But when I got married and my husband would come close to me, not even talking about like full on sex, but like just PG-13, I would tense up. Not in the very beginning, but there was a certain point where the sleep paralysis started like kicking up. It started happening all the time and it was happening a lot more. And I was like, okay, Lord, I am married now. Those days of stumbling into sexual sin, like that's behind me, but all of a sudden this experience is increasing and he would be like, are you okay? And I'd be like, oh, I'm fine. But like, I would have to like tell myself, like, 
calm down, Alicia. Like it's Jarrell, it's Jarrell, it's Jarrell. Like this molestation thing is not happening. But I had to constantly do that. And I thought, hmm, why is it that that never was an issue when I was dating? But now that it's my husband, that all of a sudden is triggering this and I'm experiencing this a lot more. It was just very suspicious to me. Now, another clue is that I would sometimes see these ministries that do a lot of spiritual warfare. And one thing that I would notice is that sometimes they would be confronting evil spirits that were specifically sexual evil spirits, like sexual demons, and that they would basically do anything to um, come against God's plan for sexuality. So whether that is you're trying to get married, but every time you have a relationship, it's like constantly breaking apart your relationships and you can't get married and there's like a pattern of that in your family. Or you do get married and it's causing strife in your marriage and it's coming between you and your husband. Or it's creating some kind of like sexual stronghold where you're caught in any number of sexual sins. And it, I was seeing also this pattern of there were a lot of ministries that I that attack that kind of spirit specifically. And that even to me gave clarity into all of my experiences with this from the actual sleep paralysis episodes, the sometimes creepy nature of them, the dream component, the way it impacted me in singleness versus in marriage, all of that, as well as this pattern that I would see from ministries that engage in this kind of spiritual warfare a lot, I thought, okay, for sure, I feel like I've seen enough. This is something spiritual. The root of this is a demonic attack. So praise the Lord, I was able to address this spiritually and break free from this pattern. Not only did I stop having the sleep paralysis, but I stopped having this, the frequent dream of someone trying to molest me, thank God. And before this video ends, I am going to walk you through the steps that you can take to fight this spiritually and to break through, and we're also gonna pray. But before I do that, there's one more thing that I feel led to do, and that is to expose even more about these evil spirits. Now I understand that creepy person, that is often representing an unclean spirit. And I believe that the Lord wants me to expose this because everybody might not be seeing what this is looking like in the spiritual realm. And if you knew the nature of them, I think there's a lot of stuff that we would not mess with in touch. As I expose these things, it is not singling out any one category of person. We are all susceptible to this in various ways. I myself, who has a testimony of being a virgin when I got married, I have had this experience. So trust me when I say I'm not pinpointing any category of person. This could happen to any of us, but our eyes need to be open to what the enemy is doing in the background. Right now, we're in a season where Hollywood is very much glamorizing the demonic and we can easily get it twisted and fall into deception. It's very easy to even start falling into a mindset where you think like, if you do believe in demons, like maybe they're cool. And I've heard people say things like, if I can't like make it to heaven, I'm gonna just have to be like partying in hell or something, you know, like making it seem like there is an option to be in hell where that is in any way gonna be a pleasant or fun experience. Let me tell you right now, that is absolutely a big load of lies. <laughs> absolutely not. The kingdom of darkness can present itself that way, but the true nature eventually reveals itself. It is very much more like what I said earlier, like if your sweet elderly great aunt turns evil and is trying to molest you, like that's not cool, it's disgusting, it's dirty, like that's the feeling that demons are giving. Okay, so let me go into some imagery that I've seen in dreams. Something that has really, really been highlighted to me when it comes to this topic is the entertainment industry. And I think there is no mystery as to why we know that our entertainment has been saturated with sexual content. And it's like in our face, it's become the norm. And it's like, it's ridiculous. It's over the top. It's in music, it's in movies, it's in even fashion often. It's, you know, it's everywhere. It has so much influence on so many people. So some dream imagery that I've seen around this. In this particular dream, it's like, I saw the entertainment industry. I saw like how forward, how much they're pushing the sexuality. And then it was like, I heard a conversation. Now, Stick with me. The conversation was coming like from behind a veil. It was like a conversation in the shadows. And the conversation behind there was like all of these words to describe sexuality. As these words are like coming from the shadows, people are saying them and calling each other them. Like, oh, she's a this, he's a that, he's a this with that, 
she's a this, this type, he's a that with that. It was like all of these words, 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 words to describe specific types of sexuality. Of course, describing types that are outside of God's plan for sexuality as presented in scripture. There were all of these words. Now, most of the words in the dream were not words that I've actually heard of in real life. It was like all of these more advanced and nuanced words than even ones that I know about. Um, there was one word that I remember hearing, which I won't say. I have heard that word in real life, but it was like that times 10. Like if you can think about it, like a couple decades ago, there were not all of these terms to describe these different like types of sexuality or types of attraction. There were just a few. But now in 2023, compared to then, there are many more. People are getting more and more nuanced in this conversation. So in this dream picture that I'm hearing, like even beyond that, like it's getting more and more and more and more broken down. And, but again, these words are coming from the shadow realm. The words are coming from there and people are speaking them and calling them to one another. Uh, oh yeah, she's a this, he's a that, he's a this, that, but it's being fed strictly from there. That dream had me shook because I really never thought about that. It's so scary because we know that words have power. God created the universe with words. He said, let there be, right? And there was light. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. And evil spirits, they get in where they can fit in. We are the ones that have to be vigilant to not give them a foothold, not open the door, give them an entry point, you know? Like Judas, he was greedy. He had a pattern of being greedy. The Bible says that he was a thief and he frequently stole from their collective money. So by the time that he went to betray Jesus, make a deal to trade Jesus's life for some money, it said Satan entered him, you know? But he already had that open door. The enemy worked in that way, looking for entry points into our life. And the tongue is a very powerful one because it's, uh, it's a way that we can give agreements to things. And so the way that this part of the dream was hitting me was like, wow, these words are devised in the spiritual realm first, in the kingdom of darkness. They come through into our realm. We get influenced. They can influence people's ideas and they become a part of culture and then people start repeating them and calling each other these things and labeling each other these things. And people identify with them. They'll say, I am a this, I am a that, I am this. And they're taking these labels that have come from the kingdom of darkness and identifying with them and making these powerful agreements and have no clue that the enemy's end game in that is to have a foothold in your life. And that's certainly not the only way the enemy gets a foothold, but it is a way and it's becoming more and more of a thing. Satan is out to attack the image of God in the earth. So he's attacking everything that God has said in his word is a reflection of his image. So I say that to say to anyone who may be, let's say you are committed to following Jesus Christ and the specific way that you struggle with sexual sin is called something in the culture. Do not come into agreement with those terms. Do not ever again say, I am a this. You can describe your behavior. You can say, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling being attracted this way. This is what's tempting me. But do not label and identify yourself with those terms and those words that are being circulated in the culture that are labeling forms of sexuality that are outside of the confines that God created sex for. We don't do that with other struggles. People aren't out here saying, I'm struggling with overeating. They don't say that like, I'm a glutton, but I love Jesus and I'm trying. No, they label the behavior, they don't label themselves. So stop labeling yourself. Do not come into agreement with those words and those terms. Two other things that were highlighted quickly, I saw an image of like a person, but it was like I saw a person being examined by the evil spirit and it allowed me to see like, this is how they see us. And it was like the person looked deformed and the way that they were being examined was so invasive so disgusting, so violating. Almost like if you see like meat hanging in like a butcher shop or something and you could like turn around and inspect it how you want. It's like, like that, like being treated like just, like you are just meat. You know, it sounds gross. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like the person in their eyes looked like mangled and deformed and it was just this very invasive and violating thing. The way evil spirits like see and use people is disgusting and no respecter of who you are. Like no matter your age, young, old, it does not matter to them. The last thing I'll highlight is the violence. All of this is also paired with like, not only this like creepy perversion, like that molesty feeling, but also there's this very violent 
very bloodthirsty, like a wild animal that's just looking to kill. That's like murdering in the dark and that's making people take on their attributes of perversion and violence. That's another way I guess I could describe seeing the nature of evil spirits. Bloodthirsty wild animals who are very disgusting, perverted, invasive, see people as meat and in the shadows trying to do things to influence people to do things that will give them footholds into their life. As we now transition into talking about how to break free of this, I'm gonna share one last image I saw in a dream that speaks to the foundation of how we get free. And then we're gonna go through some practical steps and then we're gonna pray. The foundation of spiritual warfare is salvation through Jesus Christ, period. It is only Jesus Christ that gives us the ability to confront evil spirits. We only can stand up to the kingdom of darkness because we're in the kingdom of light, which is only through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So only by being in that kingdom do we even gain the right to stand up against these evil spirits. It is Jesus Christ who conquered death. It is Jesus Christ who descended into hell, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and resurrected with all power in his hands. He is the one who has overcome the world. He is the one who has overcome the powers of hell. So it is only by following him and by salvation in him that we have the right to stand up to evil spirits. And that's important for us to know because if we haven't made that decision to follow Jesus Christ, we need to do that first before we can even work on breaking this. And then if we already made that decision, we have to be mindful. Like the only reason I have the ability to do this is in Jesus name. That's what in Jesus name means. It is because I am in the kingdom of the one who conquered this kingdom of darkness. That's what gives me the right to even do this. I'm going to share this last image that I saw. Now this one I saw when I was a teenager I had a dream that I saw myself in a white wedding dress and the wedding dress was beautiful at a big skirt but the skirt like when I would like hold it out you could see that in between the folds of the skirt was black lace now when the skirt was fully down you couldn't see that but when it was opened up you would see all of this black lace in between the folds not only that but I was standing in a public restroom stall and it was a dirty one it was Graffiti over the walls, debris everywhere, just completely filthy public bathroom. And then not only that, but also I was bleeding. I was on my monthly cycle. The picture of uncleanness was like <laughs> tripled, okay? In our own righteousness, that is the best picture that we can get. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Like, there is no amount of behavior modification that can get us to the level of purity where we can confront the kingdom of darkness. It only comes as we are reborn by Jesus Christ. Then we take on his righteousness because his righteousness doesn't have those pockets. You can be a virgin and praise God for that, but still have some kind of sexual sin or, or sin of any other kind. You know, like we're never gonna modify our behavior enough to be spiritually clean, not only to have a relationship with a loving but holy God, but also to be able to confront darkness. The only light we have is in Jesus Christ. And that kind of light doesn't come from our behavior. It has to come from being born again in Jesus Christ being born again and taking on a whole new nature. And so for anyone who hasn't taken that step or made that decision, we are gonna add that to our prayer at the end. So let's talk about getting rid of this. So we start with salvation and we have to accept his sacrificial death as paying the price that we owe God for our sins. Receive his forgiveness and his love and decide to follow him. Then we wanna close doors. The Bible talks about putting on the full armor of God in Ephesians chapter six. And part of the armor, you know, we have the helmet of salvation, but we also have the breastplate of righteousness. So even though salvation is our foundation, we also don't want to be living any old kind of way. That's like a huge piece of our armor. And so we wanna close any doors to the enemy. You know, like I mentioned Judas earlier, who had this big open door of his unchecked greed. We don't wanna be having these unchecked, unsurrendered patterns. We don't wanna have those in our life. Not like, oh, you do one thing, now here comes the enemy. It's not 
quite like that, but we don't want to have these unchecked, unsurrendered patterns of sin. We also walk in repentance. You know, that's important. We need to turn away from things that the Bible says that are outside of the will of God. So repentance is actually a big part of spiritual warfare, saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me for this. Lord, purify me. I love 1 John 1, 9. It says that if we confess that he's faithful to forgive us and purify us. I love that. I used to quote that a lot <laughs> in singleness. 1 John 1, 9, Lord, purify me, Lord. Um, you know, so we, we want to walk in repentance you know, really make an effort to change our ways, not just saying sorry all the time and doing the same thing, but really make that effort to change our ways. Really ask God, give me the grace, empower me to walk this out. So we're walking in repentance. And then I would even say, specifically when it comes to spiritual warfare, say in your prayer what you're renouncing. If you have basically through your lifestyle agreed with darkness, you need to renounce that. Like if you have agreed with darkness through your entertainment choices, for instance, through watching porn, through listening to overly sexual music, through watching inappropriate movies, or through things that you've personally done, you wanna renounce that. And by that I mean stating out of your mouth as you're praying and declaring what you are breaking agreements with. I break agreements with XYZ. I break agreements with this behavior. I break agreements with um, the spirit behind this music that I was once listening to. I bra I disagree with it. I renounce that in the mighty name of Jesus. I separate myself from it. Honestly, while we're on that point, go so far as to renounce what's in your bloodline. In the Bible, we see people praying on behalf of their nation or Job, he would bring sacrifices just in case his kids did anything wrong. You know, renounce for yourself and renounce like, and if there's anyone in my bloodline who has offended you, Lord, who has things that they have not turned away from. I renounce those activities now. Lord, let it stop with me. Once you close the door, think of it like if you ever left the front door open in your house a little too long and a fly came in, it's just like, oh my gosh. So you can shut the door, but that doesn't deal with the fly that got in back a few minutes ago when the door was open, right? So you wanna shut the door so that no more flies come in, but you also wanna deal with the fly that already got in. Sometimes people get confused because they may have left a certain activity or lifestyle or behavior behind in their past, but they didn't target what got a foothold to attack them back when that originally happened. And we have to understand like the spiritual realm definitely works like that. Spirits will absolutely stay as long as they can Scripture tells us that as well. You wanna think of it as like holding them to the contract. This house was purchased for you by Jesus Christ and you are enforcing the contract. Now again, there are a lot of believers who do not choose to enforce the contract. They're ignorant of it. They don't know their rights and so the enemy takes advantage of them. So what you want to do is you want to enforce the contract, enforce the word of God, possess the promises that are in the word and issue your commands. Don't worry about like, if you don't feel like you sound authoritative, the authority is in Jesus Christ. So I want you to use your words like they are edicts going out in the spiritual realm that must be heeded to. So as you're renouncing, say, I command every evil spirit that is attacking me, that is accessing my life because of sexual sin, because of X, Y, Z, you know, whatever you're renouncing, I command for you to go in the mighty name of Jesus. You will not disturb my sleep. You will not disturb my relationships. You will not continue to, whatever it is that they're doing, say, I command you to leave. I command you to go. I sever myself from you. I break agreements. I break all ties. I break all agreements with you. You know, say that. But another thing that you can do to like enforce the contract is to declare the word of God. So I would say, according to Psalm 34, seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So as a child of God, I claim the promise of safety over myself. I receive the angelic assistance. This promise, this word of God says that the angel of the Lord encamps around me and delivers me. So I come against all demonic activity that would try to attack me in my sleep. I declare that illegal according to the promise of the word of God. Another one that I really liked a lot was Psalm 4, 8, which says, I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, cause me to dwell in safety. So I would say, according to the word of God, as a child of God, I am promised a peaceful and restful sleep. I will not be disturbed in my sleep. So I command no enemy to harm me in my sleep, to touch me in my sleep, to inflict episodes of sleep paralysis over my sleep. I command you and I command you to cease all 
such attacks in the name of Jesus, according to the word of God. You know, hold them to the word of God. You have to declare that you are enforcing the contract. Another few things that are helpful, honestly, I would anoint my bed with oil, my house with oil. That is something that the Bible talks about. This is something that you see paired with prayer. It's something that God honors. You know, when people were being healed or cleansed, they would often be anointed with oil and prayed for. So I would anoint myself with oil, you know, take some olive oil, pray over it, say, Lord, as I anoint my bed, I declare your protection over me. Uh, you give victory to your anointed. That's Psalm, um, Psalm 20 verse six. You give victory to your anointed. I anoint my bed, Lord, because I belong to you. He who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide under the shadow of the almighty. I am under your shadow as I sleep. You know, just anoint your bed, anoint your doorpost. This house belongs to the Lord. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And I command no evil spirits to touch my home, me, any, you may not attack my family. You know what I mean? I would just anoint with oil also. Another very powerful weapon is fasting. Jesus even said that there were certain types of evil spirits that would not go outside of fasting. And Isaiah 58 also says one of the functions of, of fasting is to break chains. And so fasting is a powerful tool as we're humbling our flesh, we're inviting even more of the power of God to fill our lives. Some other things that I really like to do when, especially when I was fighting the um, sleep paralysis is worship music. Sometimes I would have that on the entire night while I'm sleeping really, really, really low. Never happened when I did that. Finally, hold your ground. Hold your ground. Evil spirits are very, very stubborn. We see that also in scripture. So sometimes it's like a little wrestling match, like figuratively. And so I would just do this night after night. So do this. If an episode happens, okay, get back to it. Like hold your ground because they are not allowed to defy Jesus like that. So I would hold to this process. We have to remember that endurance is a part of the spiritual armor. We look in Ephesians chapter six, it says, after having done all to stand. So sometimes you just have to do the right thing over time. Hold your ground and it will break. It will break. Having done that, I wanna pray with you all. So first I wanna pray with those who haven't even made the decision yet. So I invite you to pray your version of this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe that you are the son of God and that your sacrifice was more than enough for me. And I receive your sacrifice. I am making a decision to turn from my own ways and to follow you. And I thank you for saving me. And so now I want to lead us in a prayer that you can pray when you find yourself struggling. You can pray along. You can agree by saying amen. You can pause and repeat these words. You can say it in your own words. Whatever will help you to pray along with me. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your love and for your mercy. God, I thank you that you don't give up on me when I struggle. Thank you that you love me in spite of my struggles. And thank you that you don't accuse to condemn me, Lord, but you convict for the sake of refining me and purifying me. So Lord, I thank you for your love. I ask you, oh God, to forgive me. Forgive me for every sinful way in me, for everything I have done or said or meditated on that did not please you, oh God. I ask now that you would purify me your word says that you are faithful to forgive and to purify me from unrighteousness. So that's what I am praying for now. And I thank you, Lord, that I can receive that forgiveness with confidence. I now ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to continue to walk in ways that please you. Your word says that it is the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that causes us to will and to act according to your good purpose. So I'm asking, let your Holy Spirit rise up in me to help and empower me to walk out this walk. God, I want to turn away from the things that don't please you. God, I renounce them now. I repent for, and insert what you're repenting for. I repent from this. I turn away from this. God, I renounce every agreement that I have made with and fill in the blank. I renounce every label that did not accurately reflect my true identity in you. I am yours and I reject 
all labels that came from the culture, that came from the kingdom of darkness. I renounce every agreement that I've made. I renounce actions in my bloodline, any outstanding debts that were not repented for. Lord, I renounce them now. I break my agreements with and fill in the blank. God, I repent of these things. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for purifying me. I thank you in advance because you said that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I thank you that I am more than a conqueror. I thank you that even if a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Give me the power to walk this out. Continue to renew my mind. Open my spiritual eyes that I see the spiritual nature of things, that I am not falling into deception, that I'm not being outwitted by Satan because of ignorance. Open the eyes of my understanding, like Ephesians 1.18 says. Cause me to see things from a spiritual lens so that I don't walk in darkness and deception. And now, Lord, as I understand these things are spiritual, I command every evil spirit that is attacking me and my household to go in the mighty name of Jesus. I command sleep paralysis to cease now in the mighty name of Jesus. Every evil spirit that is attacking me or that gained entry into my life through sins of my own or of my bloodline, I cancel now and I command to cease in the mighty name of Jesus. Every unclean spirit that surrounds me, leave my life and never return in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare peaceful sleep over myself according to Psalm 4, 8. I declare I am protected by your heavenly angels according to Psalm 34, 7. And I command the enemy to take his hands off of me. I do not belong to you. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and I break every weapon. May no weapon formed against me prosper. So God, I thank you for the victory and I give you all the praise in Jesus name, amen. Praise God. Please like and share this video if it was a blessing to you. Please tell me in the comments how it blessed you. And remember to click the link in the bio so you can explore more about how you can become even more equipped and trained in the knowledge of the gifts of the Spirit. No matter what stage you're at in your faith, new believer or been in church for many years, this training is here to help us in the body of Christ to rise in the knowledge of walking in the power of the Spirit of God. So be sure to click that link and I'll see you in the next video. God bless.